Okay, good evening, everybody. So it's good to see you again, Pablo, and to see you again also, Mehmet and uh, Thomas. I, I think that we should wait a few minutes to others to participate. And of course, the low number of people that registered to this meeting in comparison to the previous one means that it is important for us, and especially for you, Pablo, and your people in Ukraine to see how uh, you keep uh, the, the crisis, the war uh, relevant to everybody, because I presume that this kind of, let's say, fatigue, uh, which is here, maybe is, it is common to, to many, many other countries, to many other people, to many other organizations. And as it seems like now, we, ca we cannot see yet the end of the war. And of course, we cannot project what will be and when it will be. And of course, uh, you in Ukraine still need a continuous support from everybody uh, around, around in the countries around you and also abroad in other countries in Europe or in other countries of the world, because without this uh, support from outside, I presume that things for you will be much, much more difficult and you will have some obstacles to cope with that I'm sure that our help can be relevant uh, to you. So I asked as the beginning, the, the audience to ask questions and, and uh, you, you will go through the questions and try to modify and to fit your uh, lecture uh, to the questions of the audience. And also I think that we should be focused to see how we can keep uh, interest worldwide and how to, we can uh, continue our support to you and to your uh, people in Ukraine. Yeah, thank you, Shlomo. Yeah, actually, this is uh, a we talk that uh, Pablo will update on the medical situation in Ukraine. And uh, I think there will be some time for question and answers. Uh, and I will be happily giving the word to our colleagues who would like to have kind of contribution. Maybe Thomas, would you like to say a few words also as the president elect of the Bronco Europe? Yeah, thank you, Mehmet. Um, I'm really happy, Pablo, that you uh, are with us today. Uh, as Schlomo already mentioned, I think it's quite important that we keep up support for Ukraine, keep up support uh, for the people who suffer and get an update of the situation of general practice and of the situation uh, in the, of the people in your country. Um, I'm seeing that the auditory uh, is uh, filling up. Um, I see many well-known friends uh, and colleagues from Europe, and I'm sure that this B talk uh, will help us uh, to keep the activity and to keep support uh, to uh, motivate people uh, to donate and uh, to support in other ways all your activities and the people in your country. We will have the WE talk now with an approximately 15 minutes presentation and some other 15 minutes approximately uh, to answer questions. All who are in the auditory uh, can put questions in the chat, uh, but better in the Q&A uh, section of the chat. And after the presentation, after the presentation and the update from Pablo, uh, we will discuss these questions and turn the answers to you. Uh, so, Pablo, uh, the floor is yours. Um, yeah. Thank you, thank you, my dear friends and my dear, uh, dear close, um, close authorities of, of Wonka. So, Mr. President, Mr. Mr. Ex-President, Mr. President-elect, so all of you are my really very, very good friends and uh, you know, but still you are uh, on the very high position. So I appreciate those who came to, uh, to, to visit this We Talk tonight, uh, despite of your family, family businesses and so on. So thank you for being here to get together with us. Uh, and uh, in the beginning, let me introduce myself. For those who don't know me, I am Pablo Kolesnik, I'm a family doctor, I have a PhD in family medicine. I'm a head of the family medicine and outpatient care department of Uzgorod National University. Uh, so I've been a faculty member and also a practitioner 
for almost 25 years. I am also a council member and the head of the International Affairs Department, and I was happy to, to have many, many uh, people from Wonka uh, world, to, and we accepted them as guests uh, in uh, Kiev, which was very hospitable and very peaceful that time. Unfortunately, not anymore. Uh, I am a council member of Wonka Europe, of Euract, Egyptian, and Europref. So of these uh, four very honored organizations. So um, uh, where I'm from, it mean it is meaningful for my presentation because I can say that I'm from the small town of Ushgorod in the western Ukraine, which is the capital of Transcarpathian region. And uh, this is a uh, town bordering with Slovakia and Hungary. And uh, the population is very small, 100,000 of population it used to be before war. What is the current situation in my country? Unfortunately, the war is going on. Number of the regions are under aggressors attacks and it is spreading like a cancer. You can see bombing areas uh, marked uh, in red on the, on the ma map of Ukraine. So unfortunately, it really looks like cancer spreading all over the body of the country. The number of victims among military and civil, uh, civil, civilian, uh, civilians uh, estimates tens of thousands. More than 300 children have been killed because of bombing in different parts of, of Ukraine. A lot of our uh, uh, country members, they became victims of very, um, um, very aggressive attacks, attacks of, uh, of uh, uh, people. They were civilians, but they had these attacks and we know about this. We ha have the continuous waves of refugees from all parts of Ukraine to the Western Ukraine, because it seems the safest region in, you know, in, in, the, in, you, in the whole Ukraine. And also we have people coming back home from abroad, from Europe, again to the Western Ukraine, because they feel safe here. And it made our town, small town, had, which had, as I told you, 100,000 of population before. Now it's 150,000 of population already. So 50,000 came to, Ukraine, to Ushgorod right now. What is the current situation in the country and in Ushgorod right now? Yes, we are compar comparing uh, with the other regions, we are safe place in the country, but every day and night alarm became our life's routine. Number of Ukrainian refugees leaving Ukraine from, uh, leaving Europe from Ukraine, uh, uh, for Ukraine and more than those fleeing to Europe. So you see, we have more comers to back to Ukraine than they moved abroad which we saw in the beginning of the, of the war. The population, as I said, uh, remained the same. So 150, uh, so 100 of, of the local population and 50 of refugees. And as Slomo said, I, I like this, uh, this expression and I use this in my presentation. Really, neither of the top news can be in the public aisle forever. That's why we see that it's kind of fatigue from Russian Ukrainian war in Europe. I understand it pretty well. The shock from, uh, from the situation in Ukraine can hardly correlate with the established European way of life. And it's hard to, to think always about the disaster somewhere. But instead of passing, passing con contemplation of what is happening in Ukraine, all of you who are present at this meeting have chosen the path of helping our struggle. And we are grateful to you for this, this support. This is really important for us. Uh, I had a very good tip from my friend Shlomo Winker uh, uh, to collect the data in the beginning of, of uh, making this spontaneous volunteer uh, medical work. And we started to collect the medical data to our uh, computer, which we use, which we bought using the donations from our friends from Europe. So the first computer, the first, first uh, laptop was bought from your donations. And now it's collecting our data. And we succeeded to have at least 600, almost 600 uh, 
of, uh, of medical information of about 600 uh, refugees which came to our medical uh, medical uh, site or hub uh, I can I can't say it's a clinic because it's it's not uh, right now and we had a possibility to compare three weeks after after collecting the data and seven weeks after the collecting the data and we have some interesting uh, data to, to sh sh share with you. First of all, number of refugees visitors from Kiev region has significantly decreased uh, because people fled back home. So the central Ukrainian refugees, they started to go back home. As I told you before, uh, my house was full of people. My brother and uh, his family members uh, came from Kiev. Now they are gone. So my house is almost empty. Only my nephew is is uh, is living with us, and the refugee cat is living with us. So I mean, now we see that central Ukraine refugees are going back home. Those who have their homes remain safe, but not everybody have, has this. Number of refugees from south and other regions uh, where uh, which were destroyed by war had increased. So we see it on this on the on the uh, graph. They are significantly uh, increasing uh, during these two weeks uh, or three weeks, uh, uh, which we compared. And we see other regions which are now occupied by Russians. They have no place to go back. That's why they remain here in in Uzhgorod. We consider that this is the population which we have to serve in future uh, and provide medical service there which we have to accommodate here somewhere. And we have another problem, where to accommodate people who live in the dormitories and at schools, because sooner or later, we have to get back to the education uh, and offline education. And our dormitories are full. Our schools are full of refugees. Where to accommodate these people? And it's a very big problem for the, for the city. So we see that number of female refugee visitors is constantly higher than the male refugees, which is obvious because we understand that male remain uh, in the Eastern and Southern uh, Ukraine and they defend their land and their, uh, uh, their wives, sisters and kids, they come to our safe region to escape from war. No changes as the age uh, groups of the, of the visitors, as, it, as for the age groups of the visitors. So we see that uh, major of the population are uh, people uh, more than 50. Uh, the smaller amount is uh, this, the middle age. And we see there are a lot of kids. Uh, also over 30% are kids which are visiting, who are visiting our medical uh, hub. Thanks to the ad advertising of the Medical Volunteer Center, the number of visitors has increased uh, during these few weeks, which we started to walk. So the top six leading medical reasons for the refugees visiting the Medical Volunteer Center, which is interesting to show you. Uh, and I will start with, with the way of collecting the data. Just uh, three, uh, maybe three years ago, we just implemented ICPC as the method of collecting medical data in the, in the, in the primary care. And now ICPC, which, uh, which is you know, the new, uh, new idea for Ukraine, now it helps us to collect data in a very, very precise and very quick way. Because we collect the information about chief complaint, we co complain, uh, co 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 take the information about the diseases, and we have some information about prescriptions and referrals. So it's easy to collect it, it's, it's easy to compose the information and it's easy to analyze. As you see, maybe those of you who have some uh, understanding of I ICPC and the codes, if you use it in your country. So you see the codes are below on the, on the table and these are coding according to the ICPC. If you see it on the slide, <clears throat> we see that the major problem uh, and the major reason of coming diagnosis and the same prescription uh, we have for respiratory diseases, meanwhile. And we have splashes of respiratory during the last two weeks. We have increased level of respiratory diseases. Maybe it's because of living in shelters, because of uh, crowded uh, population. I don't know, but we have to figure it out why. 
We have some small splashes of COVID, but not too many. Cardiovascular diseases are as usually uh, on the second place, and we see that uh, they are main reasons of uh, coming on the second place. So bones and skeleton diseases are on the third level, uh, uh, and we have neurological diseases, endocrinological diseases, and skin diseases, which are pretty often uh, reasons of coming and visiting the shelter. Oh, sorry, the medical center. Uh, what help could be uh, of the best for this time for us? We have to say in general that the help should be delivered from, from Europe all, only to the most trusted recipients who provided its loyalty for the donor but by its uh, past deeds and accomplishments. This is really important. Any help to the recipient should be time-bounded and uh, provided step by step. There should be a proper, properly balanced distribution of financial and non-financial help, which is also very important to mention. Being accountable to, to donor, the recipient, recipient should be free as to disposing the received aid to its uh, own will. And now about our, our needs and our uh, ideas. In my case, I can see your possible future help to my team in the following. First of all, we see, as you can see that fatigue is in Europe, fatigue from war is in Europe, observing the, the disaster in Ukraine. You can imagine how big is fatigue of our volunteers working in the, uh, during war in the centers for almost three and a half months. It's hard. And to my, to my mind, we have to understand it. This voluntarism, it's not uh, eternal. That's why we have to understand that we have to spend some financial donation, donations and we started this kind of stipend uh, to pay the volunteer for their work, not to burn out totally. That's why people work for very, very small salary, which we call stipend. And it doesn't matter what professional level do they have. Are they receptionists or are they, are they just nurses or maybe family doctors? So, I mean, they have the same, same uh, uh, stipend. And this help of the helpers is really needed to support, uh, support the team uh, to go forward. Uh, we need to cover the running costs of the volunteer clinic uh, until it becomes sustainable when we come to this clinic. We have to provide medical training, which is very important from the experts recorded or alive. So we have doctors without frontiers who came and who, who came to our city and they provided weekly uh, small uh, training sessions and it was very important. It was like hands-on practicing and we, we learned much from them. In, but now they are gone. So we need more experts to come to, to show us some new things and to train our youngsters. In future, we would like to provide future training at the European clinics, maybe for the best doctors, residents, and senior students of my team who performed well during the war as a bonus. Maybe it could be feasible for some of them now or in future. Free joining the conferences and networks. I opened this question uh, in EGPRN uh, last, uh, during last meeting. Uh, I understand that Ukrainians will, ha will have very lack opportunity to join the networks because of some costs, uh, uh, some co costs they need. So I suppose some Ukrainian talented youngsters, they have to be supported with, with the free attendance of the conferences, free entering the networks. And it could be a very good opportunity for them to invade to the, to the uh, European networks. Hands-on training to be provided by visiting international experts, those of you who are brave enough to come to our country, at least to the safest part, which is my town, you are very welcome to be here as, and to, you are welcome to become international family medicine experts uh, to give us uh, uh, hands-on training. And in future, when the international clinic, which I told you about before, uh, which, uh, which could start its work, we, you are welcome to show us hands-on practicing, uh, show us uh, hands-on training uh, to, uh, with our refugees. And it could be a great opportunity for our young uh, generation to learn from the uh, foreign experts. Also, 
we can say that um, our heroic struggle against the Russian invasion is going on. Look at this interesting poster. It was exhibited just a few days on our uh, main square uh, of our city. It shows the flag of Ukraine, which was cut with the Z, which is the Russian symbol right now, Z. And it, is, it has a lot of cuts, as we have a lot of cuts on our souls right now. And do you see patches? These patches are symbolically uh, shown with the flags of all your countries, my dear colleagues from the whole Europe. We are really gra grateful for these patches, which don't heal the whole wound, but which show us your support and which, which give us some small benefit to heal some small, uh, small cuts uh, and small uh, invasions on, on, on our souls. We are still alive. We are still strong. We are still optimistic and unconquered. And we believe in our mutual victory. As we know, this is the world-known phrase which we have in Ukraine. Slava Ukraini, Heroiam Slava. Glory to Ukraine and glory to heroes. Today, these are two phrases which we hear all, all over, uh, everywhere. And we understand that they are meaningful for us. If you want to contact me, please use my email address. And I have a great, I, I'm, uh, I want to express my gratitude uh, to the colleagues, to my, uh, my friends from Wonka, uh, Wonka board uh, for this opportunity to communicate with you and to speak out to, for the whole Europe, to uh, share our pain with you. And maybe this pain is less now. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention and I am ready to your question, for your questions. Paolo, thank you very much. Very, very good uh, summary and update for us. And maybe uh, our dear colleague uh, who asked the first question, uh, the Vice President of uh, UEMO, uh, Mary McCarthy, is asking how can we best help doctors in Ukraine, especially general practitioners, family doctors? This is the question. Uh, thank you very much. It's, it's a great, great uh, pleasure to hear this. And, uh, you know, I know that uh, there are still people, uh, there are people who, are, who are still willing to help. And I appreciate this. So first of all, we started due to the uh, support of Wonka members, due to the help of the Wonka authorities, uh, we started uh, uh, our movement to make the uh, international medical training clinic for the uh, refugees uh, uh, and to become this project real. So, and in three months, we will move into this clinic. So there we will need more experts. There we will need some, uh, some financial support, but still, I mean, today we have a lot. We have a space, we have a, a team, we have some money to, to buy some furniture and some equipment, but we still have to think about running costs and help the helpers. So, I mean, donations are always are always appreciated. The second question is that, that we need experts to come. And if you have this opportunity, please come. You are more than welcome. And the third way, uh, way you could, uh, you could um, uh, contribute, I suppose this is this uh, UCIT project, which we started with Eurac which is the online education for doctors all over the whole Ukraine. Sometimes doctors lost their universities and institutes in some Eastern regions. They have no contacts with other colleagues. They, know, they have no contacts with peers. That's why this UCIT project, which is online education, could be a great opportunity to show this unite union uh, of, of doctors, to show support of European doctors. So we started and we had a very big a big uh, opportunity to get these uh, um, lectures from the lecturers, but now it's a technical question: how to translate this and how to provide this in Ukraine. So we need this also support from you, you uh, from from Europe. And if there are some people who know Ukrainian, this could make it very easy easy to to or maybe even Russian. So to to translate the the lectures which we already have. So we have more than thirty lectures uh, prepared for this UC. Thank you for the question. 
Yeah, that this is the summary of uh, all uh, the questions which we have in our minds. I think Thomas, would you like to uh, ask something? Yeah, I would just like to emphasize uh, because I personally do uh, do have the contact to two Ukrainian GPs which are here in Germany, uh, which could perfectly support such projects like you said. And uh, Pablo, I would like to ask regarding the training options for Ukrainian, let's say, junior uh, GPs or, uh, or trainees. Um, what do you think? How could this work? Uh, to what times, uh, to what countries uh, are you aiming? Uh, thank you, Thomas. Uh, really, uh, it's a good question. Uh, now I can say that it is related to gender. Unfortunately, men are not allowed to cross the border. That's why I feel a bit very much upset not to be allowed to, to cross the border to, to, to meet my colleagues in, in, the, in the other countries. But women are allowed. So if there are some, if there are some opportunities to invite our young, young uh, ladies who are volunteers and who have been volunteering for three months already and who are going to be volunteers in future, if they're English speaking, I suppose it could be a great, great push, a great inspiration for them to get some news, to get some, some, some uh, knowledge if uh, they are invited to any of the European countries, countries because now it's possible from the Western Ukraine to travel uh, for women and, uh, and kids. But as for men, I can't say. Maybe after war, uh, the young man could be also invited uh, and the other thing which I stressed on during my presentation, I would like to um, ask Wonka Europe to think about future opportunities to invite youngsters, young generation, English speaking doctors, outstanding doctors who showed their, uh, their volunteer spirit during the war to invite them for free to, to join their networks. We need the fresh new blood of Ukrainian doctors and we need your support uh, of the young young doctors. Once I be among, I, I was uh, among these young doctors when Wonka invited me for the for the fellowship for the first time. It was long ago, almost 20 years ago. But for me, it was a great opportunity for, for to meet all of you, to become friends with you. To my mind, it was an outstanding opportunity. But I want to not to be alone now. I want to to strengthen the the young generation of family doctors here. Yeah. Can I ask a question, Thomas, yeah. if there are no, first of all, questions from the audience, but uh, if not, I can ask something. So, uh, Pavlo, uh, we are very appreciating your activity, but we want to see a ways that you can suggest to increase and to spread it. You know, Oshgorod is one, one city, very important one with the medical school and with Pavlo also. But, uh, you know, we want to see, you know, seeds of your project in other, uh, other cities, other villages around. Let's start a run in your district, around your city. Uh, I think that uh, it will be a great success if you will be able to recruit and to spread this project to other cities. I presume, as I understood, refugees prefer, prefer to stay in big cities and not in villages. So maybe you can choose one city not far away from you, which where you have friends, and try to spread the project to give new energy uh, uh, to, to lift it up. Uh, thank you, Shlomo. Actually, uh, now we already started this, uh, this activity. I can't say that it is very big activity, but we understand that uh, refugees are not able to get accommodated in our city and they are already located, located around the city, so in some villages. Actually, we have a very, uh, a very uh, rural uh, area in, in our region, so more rural area than, than, than towns or cities in the, in the region. So we have young doctors who worked with us in our young team, and now they are going to go to the, to the uh, villages with the, doctor, with, with the mobile, uh, mobile teams, uh, of uh, doctor with doctors with uh, without frontiers, so they are English speaking. They could translate. They could learn from the doctors of uh, without frontiers, and they could provide family medicine, uh, family, family medicine um, 
support in the villages. So this moment already started and we have a, a feeling that in future, we could cover this uh, region, this, this uh, uh, villages with refugees, with the real family medicine help uh, together with the foreign, foreign uh, experts. Yeah, just there, Thomas, there is there is a very good contribution by Tony. I think if you can yes, yes. transfer it. Yeah. Yes, just Tony asked uh, one question from the WHO European Center for Primary Healthcare. Currently, are developing jointly with other WHO units and headquarters and other United Nations agencies a rapid assessment tool uh, for primary healthcare service needs for refugees but also for host country citizens. And he says, this is pilot, pilot currently at the border between Moldavia and Ukraine, and uh, hopes that this is uh, useful. Uh, and Tony also asks, uh, do you experience if host population and refugees get the same primary healthcare services? Are the needs of refugees different from uh, host country population? Uh, what about mental health issues? Uh, there is data that mental health is one of the most prevalent problems. Uh, thank you, Tony. It was uh, it's uh, so. Th thank you, Aaron, uh, for the for the questions. Actually, uh, as for these uh, United Nations uh, activities, we we try to join the big organization like WHO and uh, United Nations uh, and uh, other organizations. Unfortunately, we didn't get any any reply. So I sent them our project. And unfortunately, it was not accepted by them, by, by, by this organization. Maybe we have to go forward with this. Maybe we need the support from Wonka uh, to support us uh, by the big organization. I understand that a lot of requests are coming from, uh, from uh, many, many places, but maybe we're also worth, worth uh, uh, getting some uh, feedback. Uh, so as for the uh, equity, of the um, primary care services for, for the refugees and for the host population, I can say that this is equal. Actually, people can get the same, uh, same uh, medical help. And now I can say that they could get a very good, high quality uh, medical help by provided by us, by the faculty members with a big experience and also together with youngsters who could provide not, not, not worse uh, help right now. Uh, the good uh, thing is that uh, the host population and refugees have an opportunity to get access to the state, uh, state, um, uh, state uh, medication, free medication system, for example, and state referral, free referral system. For example, if you come with hypertension or diabetes or hepatitis B or C or whatever, you have a free access to the medication whenever you are now. You need just the family doctor's prescription and referral. And it works here pretty well. If, you, if they get access to us, they will definitely get this free, uh, free treatment. Uh, this is despite of their living place. If you are a refugee or if you are a uh, Ushgaran citizen, you will definitely get this free, free access. Not every disease is, is possible to to uh, cover with this state support, but some diseases are, uh, are possible. And we have one more option, which is a very generous option from some church, which offered us to make some topical, like individual help to people with the very, very severe diseases. For example, if we need this oncological uh, 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 treatment or some uh, cardiovascular, very heart diseases, and they need some special treatment, which is not covered by the government, we could provide this for free using the funds from the church, which is also an, a, an opportunity and option for, for these people. So I can say sometimes refugees could get even better help uh, comparing with the, with the local citizens in some ways. Uh, as for mental health, uh, health, we have a lot of problems with, with psychological distress and it's, it's, it's uh, understandable. People survived a lot of stress and a lot of crisis in their life. We understand that uh, they, some of them lost their family members. Some of them lost their houses. They have no houses anymore and they have no place to go back. But some of them cope. It's interesting to show you that, uh, to tell you that 
a very big number of people, they could cope with this very big psychological disaster. And we have only maybe 20, 30%, I can't tell you exactly the, the number, but out of 100, 30% will get this distress. 70% will cope. It's interesting. And uh, we see that uh, there are some victims among kids, which is really very, very big problem. So for example, kids would have aneurysis. These are very, very common problems in my, in my practice. So they would have the sucking, uh, sucking uh, thumb in their age, which is not typical for their age, or they would have some uh, insomnia, very typical, or nightmares. This is very important to know because we need them to be supported by, this, by the psychologists and we don't have enough psychologists. Maybe some people from abroad would come to, to support these kids in psycho, psychotherapy because really ch children's psychotherapy is very important and not very, very understandable here. We have some psychologists, children's psychologists, but I am not sure about their quality. We need the support of children uh, who survived the disaster. Okay, thank you, Pablo, uh, for responding. By the way, I just did email you the uh, email address of Tony uh, upon his request, uh, so you can get in touch with him. Um, thank you. And uh, can just agree that uh, mental health issues are very important. Um, we are also supporting, as you know, by developing a PTSD a screening tool. Uh, Aaron is asking, uh, you asked for experts to come to Ukraine. However, Ukrainians are also experts in many areas. Do you have thoughts on how Ukrainian colleagues could also share their lived and gained clinical experience and knowledge? I think this is a very important question because uh, Ukrainian colleagues currently have experiences, unfortunately, uh, which uh, nearly no other colleagues uh, have in, in Europe. A very good question. Actually, we also thought about about inv invitation of, of experts from abroad, but now, unfortunately, we become experts in some unique areas like war and uh, disaster. Uh, uh, and now we can share a lot of things. For example, I can say that uh, I'm sharing uh, my own experience and the, my team's experience with the European community in my short releases which I send from time to time, weekly or every several weeks. I suppose this is something which could be, uh, could, could give some update information uh, about the situation here. Also, I share the experience about, about uh, uh, our projects activities and about medical data. So, and I suppose it's possible during Wonka conference, for example, uh, URACT uh, meetings and so on. So this is the way I do it. So, um, but, uh, uh, we were we were surprised when our colleagues from US and from um, from Europe uh, from from the uh, doctors without frontiers they came to Ukraine and they taught us their way of of uh, practicing and we taught uh, them our way so it was a very nice exchange of of different ways of organization for example uh, uh, I have a very interesting example they came to us showing how to organize medical help in, let's say, in the, in the shelter or in some, some, uh, some not, not specially field fit, uh, fit place. But it's not in such place right now in Uzgarat, for example. We have some settings which is possible to organize a better way of, of, of medical help. So which we are doing. And so that's, that's why we showed the, our way how we do it in a better settings. And so on. I suppose uh, a lot of things uh, could be could be shown and could be uh, exchanged. And maybe in future we could make more um, collaborative networks. Maybe maybe some some joint joint projects together. So it will it is also an option. Uh, and hopefully when we are allowed to go uh, abroad from the safe country uh, uh, which has got victory, uh, hopefully we will be able to to share our experience uh, with the whole world. But again, I want uh, more people, more doctors to be invited to different networks to spread this information. We have a lot of talented youngsters and we need to, to move forward. So thank you, Pablo, we did hear your appeal. 
regarding this exchange and especially regarding supporting uh, the young physicians, the young GPs. Uh, currently, I'm not seeing any more questions coming in the chat or in the Q&A session. Uh, I just would like to give advice to the auditory that the whole webinar will be online as a podcast and will be available through the Wonka Europe website and through social media. And uh, maybe Shlomo, uh, you have some closing remarks yes, uh, yes. for the session. Yes, thank you, Pavlo. And I would like to announce here to all our audience and you can spread it among your uh, friends that we this year will dedicate the Wonka Open meeting in London to the Ukrainian situation. Of course, Pavlo will be one of the speakers and we hope to have at least another two speakers from Ukraine and we will talk and discuss about the situation and especially and what we can help further to our uh, colleagues in Ukraine. So we are all invited to London, you are all invited especially to this open meeting and it will be recorded and uh, if you will not have the opportunity you may catch up it later. Thank you, Shlomo. I wish I could be in London in real time, but let's say at least online. So thank you for this honor to be invited there. I couldn't even imagine to become a keynote speaker on one committee just maybe 10 years ago, but now it's, it's the real situation. Thank you for this invitation. Thank you very much. So I think this is time for us to, uh, to finalize. We already had 15 minutes more than we scheduled, but this is a very important topic. And thank you very much uh, because you have a lot of things to do and you are, you are not in normal times for sure. How long? This is good to have the information and update from first hand from you. And it's very nice to be together with you tonight. Thank you for participation for all of our colleagues and thanks to our president and president elect also. And uh, um, I think we are over now. Um, good luck and we are, we are supporting. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. All the best. Bye bye. Bye bye.